Welcome back to the Governance Podcast. My name is Sam DeCanio. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Political Economy and the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Governance and Society here at King's College London. Our guest today is Neil Ferguson, who is currently the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and a Senior Faculty Fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University. Neil's the author of a number of books discussing a range of topics in political and economic history. His most recent book is Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe. Neil, thanks so much for being with us today. It's great to be with you, Sam. I even have uh, one of my children doing a master's at, at King's right now. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of doubly engaged intellectually and in the family way. Fantastic. Um, I wanted to begin by asking you, uh, how did you become interested in history? I was uh, a teenager uh, in the 1970s, growing up in Glasgow, and history was all around. My, my grandfathers had served in the World Wars, uh, one in the first, one in the second. The school I went to, Glasgow Academy, was dedicated, the entire school, as a war memorial to the dead of the First World War. And my first history book was A.J.P. Taylor's illustrated history of the First World War, which my parents had a copy of. So I remember being drawn to the great question, why was the 20th century so horrifically violent from quite an early age? The thing that really swung it, though, was reading War and Peace, uh, Tolstoy's great novel. And at the end of War and Peace, Tolstoy offers this essay on the philosophy of history, which I can honestly say changed my life, because it was reading that that decided me to study history at university rather than literature, which I had guessed had been the other option up until that point. And what was it about, uh, about that essay? That was, that was so influential, that you found so engaging? Well, I was simultaneously studying the 30 years war at school. And I was toggling between writing an essay on the 30 years war and writing an essay on Hamlet for my English teacher. And one afternoon at the suggestion of my history teacher, a wonderful man named Ronnie Woods, I went to the Mitchell Library which was my first experience of a, a serious research library. And there were all the books on the 30 Years' War, an entire shelf of them. And the first book uh, that caught my eye was Schiller's history of the 30 Years' War. And I remember thinking, there are so many books and so many different views of this conflict what a formidable intellectual challenge. When I went back to writing about Hamlet's encounter with death in the play, it felt like a, a narrower challenge. And so that, that was the, the turning point, the realization that the great question, why high levels of lethal organized conflict was a history question that I couldn't really get answered by Shakespeare, but I needed just a huge array of, of historians to help me to help me answer it. That was that was the turning point. So much of what you've written alternates between political history and economic history. And what you've just discussed is sort of a very interesting account of your early interest in history and literature. When did you acquire your interests in economic history? I was a numerate child. Uh, history was a subject I liked, but mathematics was probably the subject I was best at. And I remember realizing shortly after arriving at Oxford in 1982, I suppose, that I was more numerate than my English contemporaries and that this might be an edge. So I, I steered towards economic history because I thought I could do it well. I also had a, an interest from my school days 
in economics. I remember reading Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations at my father's suggestion one day when I was off school sick. He just handed me the book and said, if you're taking the day off school, you'd better read this. So Smith was my first uh, encounter with economics. I then delved into more modern economics and was put off. I can remember looking at the, uh, the textbook that was then widely used, uh, Samuelson, uh, by people reading economics at undergraduate level. And I thought it was awful. It was awful Why? because it was awful because of its profoundly unhistorical approach, the, the attempt to reduce the great uh, relations of uh, human beings to highly stylized graphs and equations struck me forcibly. And I remember the feeling of revulsion well, emotionally as wrong. And so I, and I remember also seeing that chart in the, the textbook that projected Russia's gross, uh, the Soviet Union's gross national product overtaking that of the United States. And I was, uh, I was sharp enough to think that must be wrong. And so I, I turned away without much uh, uh, inner debate from economics and decided I would, would do economic history, which is a whole wholly different discipline. And that suited me well, because with economic history, uh, you don't start the lecture by saying, imagine two economies, uh, each with, you know, two products, that kind of thing. You, you don't imagine any, anything, you sit down and look at the real world and try to tease out uh, from such statistics as have survived. Uh, what was going on with trade or prices in the past. I was really interested in that and found that I was able to do well at Oxford as an undergraduate by choosing economic options. Everybody in those, used to, those days, pretty much everybody used to do uh, political thought, Aristotle, Hobbes, Rousseau. And I chose the, uh, the minority option of economic thought, which involved rereading Smith and uh, Keynes and Marx and Ricardo and much else. And it was enormously difficult. I can remember reading the general theory three times, cudgeling my brains to try to understand it. And that was perhaps the hardest thing I did as an undergraduate, but, but it forced me forward into economics. Then as a, a doctoral student, I followed the advice of Norman Stone, the late great uh, professor of modern history at Oxford, whose advice when it came to dissertation topics was to do something that involved, in his phrase, number crunching. I had actually wanted to write on satirical literature in late 19th century Vienna. I was greatly impressed by the writings of Karl Kraus. But Norman's argument was that the jokes would be very hard to translate, which was true. And it would be more uh, sensible to, to choose an economic topic. So I flipped from that to uh, the German hyperinflation that followed World War I. And that really involved a crash course in economics. This was also partly parental advice. My father's view was that history was a legitimate thing to study, but he didn't want me to starve. And so he, he advised acquiring some expertise that might be marketable, even if my academic ambitions came to nothing. And when I explained that my project required me to learn both economics and the German language, he was satisfied that I wouldn't starve. So that is how I came to write my first book about the hyperinflation of the early 1920s. What did you learn when you were writing that first book? That history is really hard to do. I remember the, the sheer horror of sitting in the Hamburg State Archives contemplating enormous leather-bound Finnbücher, the, the uh, books that you were supposed to use to find the documents that you wanted to read. And even they were illegible because they were written in Alte Schrift, the Sutherland 
uh, handwriting that Germans no longer use. I remember as I plowed into the, the documents that I first called up being aghast because they didn't seem to notice that hyperinflation was happening. A lot of the, the bureaucracy of Germany just sort of carried on uh, formally uh, sticking to the conventions of the pre-war time. And so there was nothing there. It was terrifying. I felt as if I'd stumbled into some strange parallel universe in which the historic event I was interested in had somehow not happened. And then I was saved by a meeting uh, at the British consulate with uh, Eric Warburg, who said, oh, if you're interested in that period, you should come and look at my father's papers. And his father was the banker, Max Warburg, or Warburg, uh, whose, uh, whose bank, M.M. Warburg, had been one of the great merchant banks of Hamburg uh, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. I went along, uh, and there were his father's papers in a beautiful uh, oak-paneled study, and it was all there all that I had been looking for, the debates about how to deal with the costs of the war, the letters from Keynes offering his advice about how to handle the reparations burden imposed at Versailles, files upon files of extraordinary correspondence illuminating the role that uh, German Jewish bankers like, like Warburg, Warburg had, had played. And I was off. I'd found the, the, the thing I was looking for, which was the history of that inflation, but it's political history. Because I never bought the notion that you could somehow create a silo called economic history, which you, which you separated from the political history in another silo. My view was from a very early stage that inflation was not a purely monetary phenomenon, as Milton Friedman famously said, it was a political phenomenon because only through politics could you explain why the German government couldn't balance its budget, didn't really try to stop the currency depreciating, and therefore let this hyperinflation happen. My argument was in, in the, the, the first book, Paper and Iron, that this was a, an avoidable disaster, and it was the result of a profound miscalculation about how to handle the reparations burden imposed by the Treaty of Versailles. So, um you have often uh, championed a counterfactual approach to the study of history, which I think is you know, fairly well illustrated by what you just said at the end there about the policy choices that were uh, available to German policymakers during the period you were examining. Um, can you explain what is counterfactual history and what, what is it about counterfactual history that you think makes it so valuable as opposed to other approaches historians might adopt? Counterfactual history is about making explicit the choices contemporaries confronted and showing that at the point of choice, at the point of decision, they had no certainty about the consequences of their actions. At any point in the past, multiple futures uh, lie before one. And at that moment, which to the contemporary is the present, there are, there are forks in the road. There are paths that need to be, be chosen. If you lose that in your historical account, if you write as if the path that is chosen is somehow predestined, you do a huge violence to the nature of historical experience. Uh, there's a good illustration of this uh, approach in uh, Phil Zelliker's recently published book on the failure to end World War I in 1916, uh, The Road Not Taken. I came to realize through doing history, through reading documents, and trying to reconstruct the thought processes of the participants, that there are multiple moments of of choice, and, and not just for the people at the top, for ordinary people, there are choices based on assessments of, of future scenarios and rough, roughly probabilistic thinking. If I do X, the chance of Y happening is, is so and so percent. People, even the least educated people, 
can think this way. So that was the kind of experience of doing history. And then I ran into a philosophy of history that repudiated this uh, reality of human experience by saying, think here of E.H. Carr, the historian's job is just to tell what happened. And it's just speculation and frivolity, a kind of after dinner parlor game to think about what didn't happen, what might have happened. There is a tremendously strong strain of deterministic thought in historical philosophy that goes all the way back even to before Marx. And it has persisted in the historical profession to the extent that the former Regis professor of history at Cambridge, Richard Evans, has written an entire book explaining why counterfactual history is, is wrong and is in fact a sinister conservative plot or some such rubbish. And I find this baffling because it has absolutely no uh, basis in either philosophy or science. So in philosophy, uh, in any serious discussion of causation, this is also true in the law, by the way, any statement of a causal nature obviously implies a counterfactual. If you, if you think about it for a moment, the, the claim that his, Hitler was responsible for World War II has to be tested because it implies that if Hitler had been killed prior to 1939, the war wouldn't have happened. So philosophically, any causal, any causal statement implies a counterfactual. The question is just, do you make it explicit? And my argument is, yes, you should. Because by making it explicit, you help the reader to understand how exactly your reasoning works. In the case of the Weimar inflation, I argued that there were a series of policy decisions taken in 1919, 2021, 20, that uh, made the inflation happen. And if they had been uh, done differently, it would not have happened. And I think I was able to show that in the first book. But when I, when I wrote an article for the Economic History Review that, that tried to spell out the counterfactual, showing that the Germans could have stabilized their fiscal position and their monetary position in 1920, I was denounced in a very long reader's report by the then grand master of German economic history, Knut Borchardt, for daring to ask a what if question. And I can remember receiving back this reader's report. It was very lengthy, single spaced and damning. I thought for about half an hour, my career is over. That Borchardt has basically just torpedoed the whole intellectual project, not just of the article, but of the first book. But then after 30 minutes, I realized, no, he's just wrong. He's just basically completely wrong. Of course, there have to be uh, counterfactuals. Of course, they have to be explicit. There was nothing determined by hidden historical forces about the great uh, currency collapse of 1923. And so I dusted myself down, addressed the comments, and the article was duly published. And that then led to two things. A, a change in the way that I taught so that it Cambridge and then back at Oxford, I would make students explicitly talk through counterfactuals. The, the one that kept coming up was, what if Britain had not intervened in 1914, given that there was a clear option not to, that the cabinet discussed right down until August the 2nd of 1914. At the same time as I was giving tutorials along those lines, I was trying to gather support for the counterfactual project by getting friends uh, to write essays in the counterfactual vein, and that produced the book Virtual History, uh, which I think is a good book, full of brilliant essays uh, about different periods of, of history, exploring the counterfactuals and doing it rigorously according to a very important rule that I imposed, and uh, it's spelt out in the introduction, you couldn't consider a counterfactual that contemporaries didn't consider. You had to show what people at the time thought the alternative future might be like. Uh, and that, um, that, in a sense, addresses the, the criticism that it's just uh, idle speculation. When you look at 
for example, the German plans for the occupation of Britain, which exist and we can read, or when you look at the discussions in 1914 about whether or not Britain should intervene, the alternative futures are there. We, we can see what contemporaries thought the alternative path looked like, and that keeps the enterprise scholarly. You are, in a sense, living up to uh, R.G. Collingwood's great imperative, which is to reconstitute past thought from such documents and other things that have survived. And as you reconstitute it, you reimagine that past thinking process. Well, that is exactly what counterfactual history does, because it allows you to recapture the futures that did not happen and the paths that were not taken, but which contemporaries did think about and talk about and write about at the point of decision. So as a description of the human condition, it, it, it seems as though whenever human beings make decisions, there are always counterfactual options that they wind up discarding. The, the roads I was they... discussing one this morning uh, about a rugby match that happened at the weekend. Uh, when Stuart Hogg, the Scottish captain, chose not to pass inches from the Irish try line. If he'd passed, Scotland would have scored and the game would have been on, but he held on, was tackled and failed to score. And my friend David McWilliams was torturing me by reminding me of this alternative uh, history in which Scotland would have stayed in the game and perhaps might have held out Ireland to a draw or even beaten them. So we are constantly engaged in this kind of activity, whether it's sport, if only he'd passed, or our private lives, why on earth did I agree uh, to date that person? We are creatures programmed by evolution to think counterfactually. Why we repress that when we turn to write history is a mystery that I can't solve. I think perhaps because it makes it easier. This is my ultimate explanation for the kind of Neanderthal tendency. Uh, it's just a lot easier to say we don't have to think about this stuff. Let's just write down what happened. So how would you respond to somebody that accepted your descriptive account of human choice as, as unavoidably involving counterfactuals, counterfactual scenarios, options, decisions that we did not wind up taking, that accepted that description of the human condition? but then asked, how is it that we are supposed to assess the causal claims that are being made by historians about the specific forces that wound up leading to a given outcome? So in this sports example that you just gave, um, how would we explain whether or not it was an error made by one of the defensive players that led to the point being scored or a master uh, athletic maneuver it was made by the by the ball carrier, which was causally responsible for the for the for the outcome that we observe. Um, that's one question, and I guess I had a second question involving the discipline that you Im imposed on this this uh, this collection of of essays on counterfactual history, where you limited people to only describing counterfactuals that were available in the minds of political actors at the time. Isn't it possible that that limits the historians? Um, account of causality, if there were causal variables which were responsible for producing a given historical outcome, which the political actors did not understand at the time that they made the decision? I'll take those questions one by one. In the case of uh, the missed try, Hogg had to decide in a split second which was riskier to pass uh, or to uh, try to touch down himself. And he underestimated uh, the probability that an Irish defender would tackle him and tackle him so well that he was taken out of play. Uh, so that's a straightforward enough answer. It's like the question, why did uh, Putin invade Ukraine and put himself in an extraordinarily disastrous economic that situation, he underestimated the tenacity and destructiveness of Ukrainian resistance and assumed quite wrongly that it would be like 2014 when he'd last invaded Ukraine and resistance had been very weak. 
So usually we can narrow down quite easily the decision-making process and identify, uh, even if it's not explicit in some written record, what the calculation was. So that I think is, is methodologically straightforward enough. It's better, of course, if we have documentation. And at some future date, no doubt, uh, when Putin has uh, gone from this world, there will be a way of accessing the, the documents that survive of the decision-making process, if indeed any do. I think that we as historians need to remember that our core competence is uh, dusty old letters, minutes of meetings, that kind of thing. Because we need to start there to try to reconstruct these past thoughts that we're interested in. Of course, it's possible to say what contemporaries did not know was X. And if they'd known that, uh, then they would have done Y. But you are a good deal uh, distanced at that point from the core exercise of reconstituting the, the past thought process. I do a certain amount of this because there are historical data other than letters and minutes of meetings that we can use. Uh, in particular, historical statistics allow us to see things that might have been missed by contemporaries. And I did that in the first book. I showed that what they thought they were doing by letting the, the mark, the German currency, weaken was to boost German exports. Their theory was that if you uh, let the mark slide, German exports would be tremendously cheap. And this would hurt the British and French economies so much that they'd revise the, the terms of uh, the reparations uh, settlement. And I showed using the trade statistics, which were pretty messy for that period, but salvageable, that what they'd failed to see was that although it was true that German exports went up, German imports went up even more because by having this very easy fiscal and monetary policy, the Germans had caused their economy to boom at a time when the other European economies were in a post-war recession. So they'd missed that, but, um, but it was there in the statistics. So I felt as if I was sticking to the, the Collingwood principle that I was, I was working with real historical materials of the time. So there is a way of addressing counterfactuals that contemporaries missed. In particular, I showed, I think, that they had misunderstood the macroeconomic consequences of what they were doing. So I think that that's a very sort of clear set of principles that can be applied to explaining why a group of political elites may have made specific decisions. So you can, you can use the historical record to analyze what the thought process was and the justifications that political elites used to take one policy decision and not another. But I suppose there's a second kind of historical question, which I think might be a little bit more difficult to apply counterfactual argumentation to that I think I'm trying to I'm trying to get at here, which involves causal questions about the outcomes of specific historical events, which are not simply focused on trying to analyze why a group of political elites made a policy decision that they made. So I'm thinking in in particular um, of the rival historical arguments that people have given for um, why Nazi Germany lost World War II or what the turning point of World War II was, whether or not um, the Nazi regime actually could have defeated the Soviet Union had they continued advancing on Moscow, um, whether or not the turning point of the conflict was Stalingrad, if it was Kursk, or if it was actually not a battlefield outcome at all. Um, so Phillips O'Brien has a, has a famous book suggesting that it was actually sea, sea power and air power essentially decided the outcome of World War II and that these land battles that many military historians focus on analyzing were actually unrelated to the outcome that we observe. Hmm. So given that there are these sort of contending explanations that historians give for these relatively well-studied, historically important events, do you think there are challenges that 
counterfactual history has a more difficult time answering or addressing that are not focused perhaps solely on elite decision making, but answering these sort of larger histor causal historical questions about why, for example, um, the, not, the Nazis lost World War II, or what more specifically, what this turning point was in World War II that led to their defeat. I want to make it clear that in my approach, I don't just focus on elite decision making, though that obviously is something you can't ignore. Working on the early 20s, I was in fact just as interested in how ordinary Germans formed their expectations of inflation, something that you could tease out by looking at the interaction of news reports and prices. In the same way, when I studied uh, World War I in a book called The Pity of War, I was interested in the strategic decisions that the German government took, including some very disastrous ones, like the ones that led to US intervention in the war. But I also was interested in why German soldiers began to surrender in large numbers in the summer uh, and fall of 1918, which was crucial for the end of the war. So I think you have to take the approach I'm, I'm describing and apply it not just to elites, but also to uh, the masses of conscript soldiers whose decision-making in the end decided that the war ended. When the German soldiers began to surrender in large numbers, it was over. And I wrote a long uh, essay about uh, prisoner taking and prisoner killing, trying to establish why people surrender uh, as the, they did in large numbers uh, in 1918. So I'm really interested in counterfactuals at the grassroots level, uh, because in the end, uh, military outcomes are as much about the morale of, uh, of soldiers as they are about the decisions of generals, as Putin is perhaps going to discover. Uh, he thought he had a great superiority in terms of firepower, but the morale problem uh, seems to be really crucial at this point. Ukrainians are fighting, uh, I think, more effectively than the Russian invaders because they feel a stronger motivation. Turn to World War II. I wrote a book uh, about this called War of the World, which directly addresses the question that, that you've raised and Phillips Bryan raised. In World War II, economics dominates. It dominates because once the US is a combatant, the Axis can't lose, or rather the Allies can't lose. The Axis can't win. You could run a simulation a hundred times, and maybe once the Axis would win. The probability of Axis victory is enormous. It's really, really low once the US is in the war because it is so massively stronger economically. And that's why economic historians should dominate this debate. It doesn't really matter what happens in the battlefield uh, if the United States is a combatant. It's as simple as that. And I guess from the, the question that I would have in response to, to that point. Um, which I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but you see the point that that ultimately, the reason that, that there is uh, allied dominance in the air and at sea is the US economy. There's nothing else that's really remotely as important. The reason that the Japanese are bound to lose is they're fighting the United States. They can't possibly, possibly match it. And then the United States is capable of, of devising the atomic bomb. So from my vantage point, the story of World War II is in some ways much simpler than the story of World War I. It's an economic story. Now, you can get into the nitty gritty uh, a lot, Adam Tooze does in his book on the German war economy. And you can, you can ask, could the Germans have fought the war more efficiently? And the answer to that is certainly. Uh, but I don't think they could have altered the outcome of the war. Uh, once they were fighting both the Soviet Union and the United States. And in the case of the current Ukraine crisis, even though Ukraine has a much smaller economy than, than, than Russia does, what would the explanation be for why you, you would, you would uh, I'm assuming you're making a prediction uh, that Ukraine is going to fare better? 
given the earlier comment you made about their morale. So I guess well, I'm, I'm kind of curious why economics would, would perhaps not dominate in the example of the Ukraine. Well, economics doesn't always dominate in war. And Cash Nexus, which was a, a book I did 20 years ago, makes the point that if you think economics always dominates, how does the Vietnam War fit into your framework? And in the same way, uh, this war now is extremely hard to, uh, to predict the outcome of because there are potential ways in which Russian dominance in, say, missiles turns the tide of war against Ukraine in the next few weeks. We're speaking on March the 23rd, almost exactly a month since the war began. But there's also a scenario in which uh, the morale of Russian forces begins to uh, erode as the war becomes a war of attrition. And the Ukrainians are able to keep inflicting sufficient casualties uh, to at least achieve a stalemate. So we don't really know, and anybody who says with confidence they do know is bluffing how this turns out. Uh, but most wars, uh, because they are localized and limited, uh, don't have this simple economic explanation uh, to drive them. But World War II, because it was unlimited, it was a total war, uh, was bound to be decided by economic factors, regardless of the skill of, of, of German generals. I think that's the way I think about it. I, I sat down when I was writing War of the World and I read all the counterfactual essays I could find, all the different ways in which people have thought through alternative outcomes. Uh, and at the same time, I encouraged uh, my eldest son to use strategy games to, to play around with scenarios. I should say that there's, an, there's a whole other way of approaching counterfactuals that we haven't talked about, and that's, that's to imagine that you can model the past well enough to run simulations of alternative pasts. Computing power reached the point in the last 10 or 20 years where you could create quite sophisticated strategy games. Uh, I was involved in the design of one, Making History, uh, made by Muzzy Lane. And Making History is a World War II game which has pretty accurate inputs in terms of the capabilities of the, of the combatant powers and a pretty good AI interface, which means it generates plausible alternative uh, paths. And so with this tool, you can, you can test out hypotheses. For example, you can see what happens if Britain intervenes in 1938 follows Churchill's advice. So you can see what happens if uh, the Japanese uh, uh, attack the, the Soviet Union uh, instead of the Western empires. Now, I regard this as a kind of uh, supplementary activity to test out counterfactuals that uh, you might be too attached to. I was very much attached to the Churchillian counterfactual of early intervention over Czechoslovakia topples Hitler. But when I played the game, perhaps because I'm bad at playing computer games, it went horribly wrong. My son, uh, as a teenager, was much better at computer games. And he, he played uh, around until one day he came down to breakfast and, and said, I've done it. I've done it very enthusiastically. And I said, what have you done? He said, I've won, I've won the war as the Axis. And I said, that's probably not a good thing to feel great about, Felix. But it was, it was hard. It, it had taken him a long time. He'd had to play multiple iterations. It's the same if you play the board game Axis and Allies. If you have remotely realistic weightings for economic capability, you really can't win as the Axis. Uh, and the only way you can, I think we, we established, was you really do have to get Japan to attack the Soviet Union. And then the Germans have a shot of, of defeating Stalin. It's the only way it really works. This is a long roundabout way to say that I think as historians, we should be alive to the counterfactual. And we should try to find all the ways that we can to recapture the uncertainty of contemporaries. We know how it turns out. That is not an advantage. That makes it harder to write good history because we write knowing how it turns out. 
But if you go back to the betting books of Oxford colleges, as I did, and look at what people put bets on in 1940, 41, 42, you get a very different picture. Uh, I came across a, a menu in the, in the US Senate where a bunch of senators placed bets on how long World War II would last. And when you do that, you realize contemporaries don't know how things will turn out. And if you're writing history, you need to be faithful to that uncertainty, or you do a violence to the past experience. Do you think policymakers should pay more attention to counterfactual history? Yes. I, I think they should pay more attention to history. That would really help. But I think when they're studying history, they should remind themselves of counterfactuals so that they see the difficulty of decision-making under uncertainty. One reason I was drawn to write a biography of Henry Kissinger is that he's one of the few people in that realm of strategic decision-making who arrives armed with history, armed with a strong historical sensibility and an understanding that decision-making takes place under uncertainty. There are not going to be magic data that arrive just in time to help you make your mind up. You do not know at the, moment, at the moment of decision, the, the way that the path you've chosen will turn out, and you will never know uh, how the alternative path would have turned out. His problem of conjecture is a brilliant insight, which I, I'm really glad that, that I got from writing the first volume of the biography. The problem of conjecture is that at the moment of decision, if you are seeking to avoid some national disaster, and you think there's a way of avoiding it, but it will incur costs, there is an asymmetry. Because if you take the hit, if you pay the cost and avert the disaster, you will not be thanked because people aren't grateful for disasters that didn't happen because you averted them. If you take the line of least resistance and you don't incur the costs and you just hope that the disaster doesn't happen, you may get lucky, maybe it doesn't happen, and then you're a genius but you may not be lucky. The disaster may happen and uh, you wish you had, you had incurred the costs. So there's this asymmetry, which is a particular problem for democracies, that there, aren't, there isn't much gratitude for disasters that you averted. Who knows? Maybe George W. Bush's war on terror averted multiple 9-11s. Maybe it did. There's no way of showing that it didn't. There really isn't. I suspect that it wasn't invading Iraq uh, or Afghanistan that averted other 9-11s, but one has to at least consider the possibility that something the Bush administration did prevented another 9-11 from happening, but they get no credit for that. By 2008, this was a deeply unpopular administration that certainly wouldn't have secured re-election if Bush had been uh, able to run again. So there's the very important point here that policymakers need to understand. Not only is there a counterfactual or multiple counterfactuals sitting there on the table when you make the decision, and you'll never really know if you made the right call. Worse than that, if you did make the right call and you avert national disaster, nobody will thank you. Well, on that hopeful and sunny note, um, I guess I uh, just wanted to say thanks so much for appearing on the podcast. It was a very interesting discussion. Um, and uh, hope to hear from you in the future. Thank you, Sam. If, if anybody listening has been swayed in the direction of doing more counterfactual history, I will, I will feel that my work has, has not been futile. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.